Hello, everyone. This is uh, Jeff Mansfield and Jennifer Zeman with Proctor Worldwide. We are here today to talk about education and workforce development and some best practices. Um, jumping right into the, uh, the study, um, we started this research in uh, July uh, and ran it through October of 2018, uh, interviewing around 40 uh, respondents on a variety of different topics. Um, pertaining to workforce development. Uh, we interviewed individuals such as CEOs, HR directors, vice presidents, and manufacturing supervisors with direct knowledge, knowledge to share on um, the, the topics at hand. Um, the, the focus of the research included best practices, identifying uh, potential solutions, some case studies, real-world examples, and uh, you know, ultimately learning how markets outside of the packaging and, and processing uh, equipment space are dealing with the same challenge. So we've got a very well-rounded uh, area of discussion uh, pertaining to some ideas of, of how to solve some of these problems. For, day, for today's presentation, we're going to focus on uh, two different areas. Uh, hiring talent, you know, essentially where to source and, and, and how to help replace an aging workforce as they exit the, the businesses. And then retainment, you know, essentially strategies that organizations are using to help keep uh, new talents that they hire and ideally uh, help with the transition of, of retiring workforce leaving the organization. Um, we wanted to start with a discussion on essentially where recruiting is happening first. And uh, ultimately, um, we found through research that there are really four targeted demographics that organizations find that they're pooling most of their candidates from in the packaging and processing space. Uh, we've got high school and college educated, followed by retired workers, um, women, and then transitioning military. Uh, the first demographic was of no surprise. The, uh, there's a high targeting area, very frankly, nearly every industry when it comes to uh, new talent of colleges and, and high school graduates. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, what resonates with the, the members of, of that demographic in, in the next few slides, but ultimately that's the, the, the first place that people are pulling from. Um, the next category was a little bit surprising, that, that you also have organizations that although uh, they've got members of their business retiring, they're seeking out retired uh, work, uh, workers. Uh, this is not only their own staff, but also finding uh, staff that recently left other organizations. Um, uh, companies are finding that, that while, they, um, while, while people retire, there's still a large group that still want to be actively involved. It's just at a different level and different, under different working conditions. And we'll talk about that in a little bit as well, about how to attract and retain some of those individuals. Um, respondents as well as our organization felt that there was a large opportunity in the last two demographics of recruiting former military and women into the work, uh, workplace. Both look largely underrepresented women as a percentage of uh, employees in a workspace, in particular in manufacturing, and then there's a large supply of former military personnel. Uh, ultimately, um, we found that, that there were very few differences between organizations when talking that this, these were the, the four primary pools that, that organizations pulled from. So let's start talking a little bit about um, pitching the youth. You know, that first demographic that we talked about with high schoolers and, and uh, uh, or high school graduates and, and college graduates. Um, obviously, one of the best sources for future workers is recently graduating uh, citizens. Um, there can also be a very pervasive group to attract. Um, one of the first realizations or findings that we uncovered in speaking with people was the fact that, that organizations have found that they're battling this, this perception uh, that youth has on manufacturing. There are stereotypes that exist, uh, frankly heavily antiquated and largely untrue. That said, uh, there's a, a good number of organizations that felt that, that when trying to attract um, you know, high school graduates that they were fighting an image that had been building for years, whether it's from parents or TV or, or just a lack of experience or knowledge. But ultimately, that image prevented you know, potential talent from, from seeking manufacturing work uh, as a potential career or job opportunity upon graduation. Um, as a result, organizations that identified this as a challenge, and uh, there were quite a few, found that uh, the best strategy here was working with the community and education outlets to really engage them to, to, to break that stereotype. Um, the focus here is not necessarily 
um, doing it, you know, in the senior year of, of high school, but actually starting programs in a far earlier basis. Um, this would be uh, hosting some type of career event, or open houses were something that was mentioned quite frequently, engaging in educational programs or sponsoring events within schools, um, ideally uh, aiming for as young as possible. And so it wouldn't be uncommon to see uh, programs in freshman uh, year of high school or even junior high talking about the manufacturing workplace. And, um, and the, the purpose there is largely changing the image, uh, making it not look dirty and, 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 and hard, back-breaking work. It has more to do with how technological it has become, the elements and opportunities in engineering and uh, you know, manufacturing technologies the degree of robotics and automation, all of those things that really help change the image that manufacturing has in, in the eyes of youth. And obviously it's not every uh, youth, but, uh, but many. Uh, the case study we provide here on the screen is a great example of an uh, organization that really took to heart the, seeking to break the image. You know, and, and it's you know, starting as young as possible and essentially painting a different career path. You know, again, it's the idea of changing the image of dusty and dirty. We, we pause and, and, and want to challenge throughout the presentation just some thoughts and questions to, to ask your own organization as you look at this topic. And the first one is, is a real early one, which is, again, how, how early do you develop um, you know, the, the, the manufacturing employee base uh, in your organization? How do you attract the next generation? Now, ultimately, uh, if you wait for change until, if you wait to change the image until potential candidates are entering the workforce, you may find that you're too late. You know, it's really all about trying to engage uh, the, the work, for the potential workforce as early as possible through a variety of different creative programs. And uh, you, you may find that there's some, some interesting opportunities that start to develop from it. Uh, no different than planting a seed. Moving into the next part of the age bracket of, of you know, graduating talent. Um, High school recruitment was mentioned very frequently as a major focus for, for many of the companies interviewed. Um, it's related to cost structure, the types of work, and frankly the idea of building long-term relationships with employees. Again, not necessarily a surprise there. Um, our focus really was understanding, well, how can organizations, what can they do in order to, to attract this talent, keep this talent, or what has the most success? And we found that there were two predominant strategies that, that most of the respondents we spoke to spoke highly of. Uh, the first one was apprenticeships, um, and then the second was job fairs aimed at high school or, or early, early on in community college. Um, the idea there is to educate potential employees about alternative viewpoints to a four-year university program. Everyone we spoke to basically said that obviously going to college is fantastic, but it doesn't mean that's the only route. And ultimately, you can make a fantastic career taking on different types of trade skills within the manufacturing space. And that ultimately, um, organizations were realizing that, that apprenticeships and job fair type programs, but certainly apprenticeships, were designed to help educate the workforce on the potential uh, of, of manufacturing jobs um, before they make decisions into a four-year university. Um, and that gave them an interesting stream of talent to consider. Um, some of the most effective programs we heard related to internships or apprenticeships included uh, summer work programs, part-time work. Um, uh, you've got opportunities where they're, they're, they're paid programs as well. Some of the respondents we spoke to highlighted the fact that, that paid apprenticeships or internships were valuable to, uh, to the, the, the opportunity. One, it, it allows uh, high schoolers to, to earn an income and, and start to understand the benefits of working in an organization like that, as well as, frankly, getting um, work done. Um, it, it's, it's not just uh, an opportunity to, to educate, it's also an uh, opportunity to execute uh, responsibilities within the, the work stream. And it ended up being uh, effective. Um, many organizations talked about the ability to continue to recruit talent and interns or apprentices as they, uh, as they graduate, and at the very least have an open door communication for um, different options and availability as, as uh, those students mature and have to make a decision to where to go. The idea behind all these programs is to continue to change the image, offer opportunity, offer a degree of direction, but frankly create really a common ground 
to a, uh, to attract uh, uh, young employees into the organization. The next demographic area um, is, is uh, college. And uh, when speaking with sources, again, no surprise about the college element. Uh, obviously, as, as the technology and requirements in the manufacturing space, in particular for you know, um, packaging machinery and, and processing, uh, food processing, um, colleges are an important you know, uh, potential stream for, for candidates. Um, when speaking with respondents, the best source of, of recruitment uh, ended up being internships. Uh, internships were viewed as, as um, ways to, to, to capture students as they're preparing to graduate and pulling them into the workforce relatively early um, before others can present them opportunities and, uh, frankly, develop a degree of comfort with an organization. Uh, to make these effective, um, the largest strategies that organizations really utilize are partnerships and relationships with colleges. So it's not just about offering an internship, it's about developing a relationship with the universities and, and campuses that are providing these, these, uh, uh, the, the talent pool. Um, these programs from working with colleges and universities really helped organizations identify the top talent, but also promote the organization through a network with inside a university or campus, a community college, that um, ultimately helps um, spread the word about the potential opportunities of working for uh, the organization. Um, one of the, the, it was mentioned a little less frequently, but certainly of interest that was raised by a handful of respondents, were some programs that they were executing that they identified as experimental, experimental uh, education. And what we mean by that are essentially programs that are designed to mix classroom education and knowledge development along with real world experience. So these were programs designed with the university that takes them through uh, the, the, the textbook part of the, the job, but then giving them a real world experience um, working within these facilities. Um, the programs are extensive in terms of their length. You know, a, a, a program is essentially done in two parts where the first quarter, say, or semester is spent with textbook and then the following semester or quarter is spent uh, actually in a 12-week program within the facility itself. Um, these programs that were mentioned by the few sources that brought them up as highly successful, but again, that relationship with universities is, is, is critical to that as curriculum and programs are developed around it. Um, but again, what we found was that the, of the people who mentioned these programs existed, um, they would produce pipeline uh, employees every, every, every year of one to two but then the, the most important part of that was the 0% turnover. So one of the challenges that, that respondents often talked about during this entire engagement was the fact that sometimes it's possible to find talent relatively quickly, but the problem was retainment of that talent, that they'd lose a lot of the candidates that they brought in within the first year, meaning that the problem of, of underemployment within the business or talent gaps never really was solved. If anything, there was money lost in the development. So, Organizations are routinely looking at programs to not just develop talent or bring in talent, but identify talent that ends up staying. Um, when talking about well, how, how, well, what can you do to do that, organizations that had these types of programs, these experimental, experiential learning education programs, often referred back to that as, as providing, you know, again, people who end up staying with these types of programs and then employing uh, with the business end up uh, staying for a, a longer period of time, a far longer period of time. In thinking about your recruiting strategy, how do you engage your local colleges? What do these programs look like? Um, is there someone at your organization who's specifically tasked with finding talent and attracting talent with these, within these types of partnerships? You know, how ingrained are you with your local colleges and universities? And frankly, it's how committed. You know, these types of programs require uh, leadership, whether it's through HR or executive ownership. Um, again, organizations who, who indicate that they've got strong relationships with colleges and universities indicate that they have fewer challenges when it comes to hiring and they get a better breed of candidates uh, that has a higher likelihood of staying longer in, uh, in, the, in the long run.
when engaging respondents about other places that they source talent from, um, they started to revert back to some of the more common elements that you, you, you would have heard, frankly, over the last 15, 20 years. But some notable changes uh, within those, those channels of, of recruitment. Um, most commonly in terms of, of recruitment, a lot of the organizations we, we engaged talked about the idea of finding local talent pools. But to do so with near, or, or, you know, aggressive and almost constant focus. Um, organizations are continually always looking to recruit and they always keep the, the channels open when it comes to local talent. Um, with an emphasis growing on digital technology. And that's one of the big differences in, in recruitment that some organizations acknowledge to us they're, they're being challenged with. They're, they're struggling with the idea of, of converting to, to the digital platform that frankly many uh, uh, young Americans have today. Um, there's a balance between national and local recruitment, but ultimately whether you're taking a national and local recruitment strategy, one of the largest concerns that they have with, with uh, bringing talent on is actually um, location and the commute. So one of the top reasons candidates were leaving organizations after they started had to do with uh, the commute, uh, long commute, difficult commute, and that ultimately um, organizations that took strategies to reduce the, the pain from those types of events found that, that they had a lower turnover but also had a better ability of attracting talent. Um, so uh, some strategies there uh, included a variety of different things, including changing operational hours all the way through some type of, of strategy that was you know, offering some type of um, you know, commuting service that allowed people to get to public transportation easier. Ultimately, it was just how to make uh, transportation to the organization easier. But then also on the recruiting of local and national talent, one of the other strategies that organizations routinely talked about was just leveraging digital technology on a more frequent basis, especially when attracting uh, newer talent to the, to the organization, younger talent. Um, leveraging digital interviews, um, submitting videos, um, having voice responses to questions, engaging them on a digital type of level before moving them into more official on-site interviews were viewed as highly effective strategies. Um, the, the goals of these programs are really twofold. One, younger talent, millennials uh, today um, are very familiar or more familiar with digital mediums and ultimately that serves to both uh, present an attractive appearance as an organization but also helps uh, candidates better uh, communicate with the organization and, and vehicles that they're familiar with. The, the second benefit and goal is that ultimately it allows for more effective recruitment with lower turnover. And, and the reason that is is because organizations can see more clearly how candidates interact, um, how they respond, um, and ultimately their personality types. Um, all those factors contribute to um, you know, having a more successful candidate uh, come into the organization and stay for a longer period of time versus the we bring in a candidate and within the first 90 days to six months, uh, they, they, it just doesn't feel like a good fit. Um, digital interviewing technologies, again, having videos or voice responses to questions allows more of a personality to come out and frankly it allows organizations more time to evaluate candidates. Um, organizations that, ended, that, started, that stated that they used these types of programs found that attrition and terminations dropped significantly. So a question that we start to ask is again, you know, uh, first, how do you, how do you reduce um, commute time? Well, is there programs and strategies that you can enact that allows you to attract local and, and uh, local talent to an organization um, by minimizing the inconvenience to potential workforce and candidates and, and frankly even employees. And then when thinking about um, you know, different types of strategies to consider, you know, are there times for at least uh, um, you know, white collar staff to, to be work from home on certain days, um, changing hours of operation to allow for a more convenient commuting process. And then how are you also looking to leverage digital technology in the interviewing process? Keeping with the topic 
of, of digital, we also want to talk a little bit about uh, the leveraging of social media uh, in the recruitment process as well. This is another area that was interesting in talking with respondents, uh, clear awareness that um, there are many traditional channels to recruitment today, um, but when seeking out uh, skilled talent, that there are new places that have to be uncovered and leveraged. And one of the more frequently ones mentioned uh, in terms of channels was social media and leveraging social media to help advertise the, the company, the brand, and the ov overall need for, for talent. Uh, increasingly, organizations are leveraging social media to place ads and frankly just get direct access to talent pools. Um, no different than marketing. Uh, this is done through uh, campaigns, um, creative ads, uh, and frankly, routine engagement. Uh, again, this is a, when, when thinking about how to attract talent, certainly on the younger workforce, as millennials start to, to become more developed uh, in their skill set, they've, they've gone through their first job, they're, they're looking for a longer career opportunity. <clears throat> you know, that level of workforce is looking and, and understands how to communicate through social media and what you know, it's a way to reach them. Um, we found that uh, many respondents talked about the value of, of these types of campaigns. And, and again, on, on the slide here, you get to see how they're leveraging creative plays on, on, on you know, uh, uh, elements that are present in media. You know, the reference here is, is talking about Harry Potter as an example and, and how to create campaigns to, to excite a potential workforce coming into the organization. Using social media provides a variety of different benefits. One, it's, it's, it's relatively low cost. Two, um, it uh, allows for simple communication. And three, it can be done on a near consistent basis. It also changes the image about manufacturing or continues to challenge it. If we go back to the ideas that, that, that manufacturing can sometimes have an image of sort of stodgy and, and, and old, leveraging social media is a great way of changing or continuing to advance that image with, with uh, younger talent. And again, when we talk younger talent, uh, we're moving into an era right now where, again, millennials are entering into a higher stage of their work, their, their, their employment and career development. Um, but these, these areas are not being left behind. The leveraging of social media, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, all of those are increasing um, and continuing to be used as mechanisms of communication. Organizations that don't leverage these as part of their recruiting strategies may find that it's not as effective or the talent pool is different. There are still tr more traditional you know, strategies that are being utilized, and when talking about talking to respondents about well, you know, what else are organizations using to uh, attract a talent. Um, the one mentioned most frequently or with the highest degree of at least success were open houses. Um, it still you know, it requires an investment, um, it requires planning, but ultimately organizations have found that these produce a relatively good number of candidates in each one of the events. Um, the goal there is obviously a rapid sharing of relationship or development, frankly, between a candidate and a potential employer. And what we found with, in speaking with organizations, that speed is the key element to a successful open house campaign. During these events, it's, you know, they, 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 they have their hiring managers or HR on site, and ideally are quickly moving through initial stages of interviewing. Um, the goal to um, move to a second and ideally final interview relatively quickly there and after. Um, these events are, are essentially increasing the speed of recruiting. Um, it's more cost effective than longer uh, interviewing campaigns in some instances. And ultimately, um, there's a better relationship developed with talent as they get to see the facility they're working in and ideally build bonds that are relatively early versus waiting for employment and so forth. Again, uh, when speaking with respondents, there is a heavy emphasis on the idea of finding talent as one element, but keeping them within that first 90, to, 90 days to six months or the first year really is the imperative part. Once that takes place, they feel that they've got a pretty decent uh, degree of, of, of predictability with where employees will go from there. So when summarizing some elements specific to, to hiring talent, um, 
again, one thing that became clear was that there's a, that there's a, a change in what's driving success. Yeah. Traditional or active engagement, uh, leveraging different media channels, starting early, uh, and frankly, just having a strategy around early uh, employee or early workforce development were all keys to success. Um, traditional approaches, approaches of using recruiters uh, and employment sites and resumes were actually mentioned quite frequently as not working anymore. And that, that, this was um, a, a little bit of an interesting um, uh, take. Uh, but ultimately, while recruiters can certainly bring in candidates, they don't guarantee success. And that many of the organizations we spoke to actually found that recruiters could bring candidates, but you end up having to pay relatively large costs or large fees related to that that were, you know, again, partially based on the, the salary of the employee brought in, making it a very a costly process. Well, that's great if you're fulfilling the need within the organization. It's not great if that candidate doesn't work in 90, to, 90 days to six months or in the, within the first year. Um, and, and many found that, that the, the lack of personal engagement, sort of the disconnect between an organization and the candidate via a recruiter was uh, potentially viewed as detrimental. Um, the companies that claim to have the highest degree of success found that they were not using recruiters at all. Um, and then there was frustration over the traditional employment sites and resume sites. Um, about the, the potential quality of candidates that, that came in. Uh, many of the organizations we spoke to certainly have relationships with those businesses, but they found that the, 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 the volume of resumes that came from those events or from those campaigns leveraging you know, on, on site or on, online uh, uh, resumes, there was just too many. It, it provided a stack of resumes that required hours and hours and hours to go through to not have a degree of confidence that these were the right candidates, and then subsequent hours and hours of interviews. Um, ironically, both of those types of, of recruiting strategies really indicate a level of hands-off. And if we were to structure any like, recommendation about recruiting talent that needs to somewhat change, it has to do with the fact that the, the programs that have the most success are engaging and hands-on as direct as possible uh, with the, the organization seeking to recruit and the candidates that they're seeking to attract. Um, again, uh, one of the other elements that was mentioned as well that was uh, interesting was you know, the screening of candidates and using uh, assessments, um, which is uh, an, an interesting and frankly it's an old tool that's been around for a while, but organizations talked highly about it, the idea of using, you know, um, personality assessments, you know, candidate assessments allowed for um, uh, a more effective recruiting strategy. You, you have a better idea of the type of talent you're hiring. And most importantly, you have the ability to compare and contrast between a pool of candidates. Um, assessments, generally speaking, from our experience, are relatively low cost. Uh, they can cost uh, $100 a per incident or less, sometimes a little bit more. But ultimately what they do is they really help identify traits and characteristics that are not always visible in a handful of interviews. Um, a lot of companies talked about, um, or respondents rather, talked about the success of recruiting and using pre-employment assessments really being critical to their hiring process. And that uh, they found that the quality of candidate they hired and the longevity of that candidate was, was better and longer when they knew uh, more about the person they were hiring. Now, this obviously isn't done with every candidate that comes in, but those that are at least passing the first, the first steps of the interviewing process, uh, there's a small investment made that organizations that use these the programs, uh, frankly, do not complain about at all. So we do challenge, uh, you, we do challenge you to, to really look at how you're leveraging assessments. Uh, when speaking with respondents, this was one of those elements that was mentioned as just having the best bang for the buck. You know, how are they used to, 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 to you know, think about talent? And one of the most important things that you have to do when, when, when using assessments is to actually listen to what the outputs are. So there's a handful of respondents that talked about that, you know, as an organization we've used them before, but we don't listen to what, we, to what they say. And ultimately, as a result, um, they find that they hire a banned candidate as a result. 
the, the test told them this is the type of person you're hiring, and they're like, oh, I like him anyway. Are you going to give him a chance, give her a chance? And they find out that, uh, no, it ends up being true. So if you do use assessments, you really have to understand that the, the information that they're providing is valuable, and, and you're buying them for a reason. Moving on to retaining talent and the second part of our, of, of our discussion. Um, again, this is an important part of talent management. Uh, one of the first observations that we found is that ultimately um, talent management was an important part of a company's culture and investment, which doesn't sound like a terrible surprise, but it's very often forgotten within businesses. Uh, it's moving on to you know capital investments and, and sales and, and marketing strategies and developing a new product. But what we found was that you know 87% um, of organizations felt that talent management was a medium or high priority, and nearly 90%. And and that's an important figure to consider when when evaluating your own programs. How much is talent management part of a core culture of an organization and talked about at the leadership levels? Um, when thinking about how to oversee talent management, and by talent management, that's a few different uh, elements. That's, that's, that's engaging talent, it's helping develop talent, it's listening to talent, it's, it's, it's making sure that the employee base has a mechanism to, to interact with the organization and that there's shared and common beliefs between leadership and the employee base. Um, when asking respondents, well, who manages this, we found that uh, most uh, of the respondents we spoke to uh, indicated that there is a dedicated human resource department or even a resource within that department that was focused on talent management. And that's a key distinction. And then there was a small level of organizations that leveraged someone within leadership to, 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 to lead those types of engagements. The key here from the respondents um, that spoke about dedicated human resource department or dedicated resources towards talent management was the fact that, that it was something that had more focus. Uh, respondents routinely talked about the idea that when you have someone that's focused on talent management as part of their responsibilities outside of leadership, that it produced better results. And that's because leadership, unless it was fo someone focused specifically on that area, often can become distracted or it was something that was sometimes forgotten. Uh, so we do recommend, at least based on the respondents' responses that we received, that having dedicated resource uh, towards talent management was important, um, or at the very least a function within the business, and that organizations that leveraged a leadership member to, to drive that initiative, even if it's a small one, um, found that it was uh, sometimes distracted from, from what was needed or required in, in talent management uh, as a whole. You know, asking yourself, do you have dedicated talent you know, what do they do, how focused are they? That last statement we think is one of the most important. It's the focus on career and talent development that, that really matters the most um, versus uh, a, a, a individual that has 15 other responsibilities within the organization. When engaging respondents on what organizations do um, on talent management and, and how do they help retain talent through different programs. Um, there's, uh, you know, there's a mix of different responses. You know, the first response mentioned most frequently to frankly no surprise to us was the discussion of safety. Again, it's a, it's a standard in manufacturing environments. You know, it's the first place that organizations look to improve upon. It's some of the more frequent training that's executed within an organization. No surprise there. Um, but when we really started to peel back parts of detail about well, what else are trained on, or what other type of, of programs are executed, one of the more higher mentioned topics on effective training and, and, and retainment of employees was the use of, of, of on-the-job training and mentorship. And this really had to do with employees new to the organization. They could be experienced still, but employees new to the organization that uh, really had to do with onboarding and, and longevity. How do we keep employees for a longer period of time? And again, that, that, first, that first year, the first 12 months, but certainly the 60 to, or 90 to, to 90 days to, to six months is really that, that core period of time. And leveraging some type of on-the-job on uh, training elements and, and uh, 
and uh, mentorship really is allowing an organization to connect closely with a candidate for a set period of time. We heard programs lasted for, for mentorship six months, sometimes longer, to really help an employee learn a new role. Um, several companies mentioned this as really an, 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 it's an effective model that, reduced, that re increased uh, retention rates. It was hard to get sources to give us specific numbers, uh, but respondents routinely brought up the idea that, that these types of programs really did make a difference in, in retainment. The mentorship is really the key part of that. It's not just that you do it, but it's the fact that uh, you do it with uh, helping an individual fit with the culture of an organization and most importantly defining what good or great looks like. Um, another area that we found that organizations were leveraging, and this was on continuing to develop talent that's, that's already in-house, was leveraging some form of aptitude test. Um, sometimes those are executed at the point of hiring, sometimes they're executed later on in the, in, in the employee's career but ultimately it allows organizations to essentially project where talent is today and where they can best apply them in the future. Um, companies we talked to really, t you know, talked about these programs as basically producing a faster development of an employee and, and improving retention as well. Again, uh, it's an old technique within, knowledge, within management of essentially putting people in the right seat uh, based on what they like to do. And obviously you hire talent for specific reasons or specific gaps within the business or needs. But aptitude tests will help you identify potential other areas that that, that talent uh, acquire or, or within the business as they develop can find that there's, they produce other benefits to the business that produces a longer retainment. Uh, aptitude tests were mentioned quite frequently as potential areas of opportunity uh, once you have talent to find out where to where them where they can be placed and where they can they, where they can best go. That brings us to one of the key challenges that many organizations are facing, let alone uh, many in the, the the packaging machinery and the food processing space. Obviously, as the workforce moves into retirement, um, it's, it's creating a degree of challenge. Um, there are several programs that, that respondents identified as having the most success um, about both keeping uh, employees there as long as possible and also helping with transition. Um, the first is to essentially enact and market internally um, programs that are designed for job flexibility um, once uh, you, you've got candidates or employees rather that are seeking to leave the organization or retire out. You know, these programs are essentially designed to keep uh, communication high, but ultimately employees engaged. Um, but the flexibility is areas um, where you've got um, benefits such as lower work hours, change in responsibilities, and just overall easier schedules that allow em uh, uh, employees seeking to retire um, more opportunity to get a little bit of uh, what they want. You know, ultimately, it addresses, it addresses the desires of retiring staff, but also helps keep up an income, which is important. The most important part of this is creating an accepting culture. Uh, we found in speaking with respondents that, that, that the, sometimes organizations can have a culture, a culture that is, um, uh, you know, sort of knee-jerk response to a retiring employee that's of important value to the business. Um, and ultimately, it's creating a culture that's not aggressive, but ultimately supportive of those decisions being made. Um, having programs like job flexibility for, for individuals have indicated that they're going to retire out of the business really um, uh, helps lend to employees wanting to talk about that, but then also engaging in, in, in those types of decisions that are supportive to the business. That leads to one of the second tactics, or the other pri tactics that were raised, and that's really prior notice campaigns. Uh, companies have increasingly put this as part of their policy, but most importantly, it's part of their culture. It's talking with employees about retirement and developing a plan well in advance of this taking place. A handful of the companies we spoke to, or respondents rather, indicated that they have programs that basically uh, request or require 12-month notification in order to qualify to certain benefits um, or certain incentives that take place. Um, a handful of program, a handful of respondents we spoke to actually indicated that they had, you know, two to three year uh, notice programs. Um, these were exceptions. There weren't many of the, the, the people we spoke to that had these types of programs, 
but they also prove that they are possible, that uh, ultimately you can find that you know, candidates or employees rather will, will tell you that they, they're looking to retire well in advance. Um, these programs are developed to essentially connect retiring staff uh, to, to newer hires. So when you have these notification programs, the idea is a transition plan. And it, it's essentially, we, we kind of talked about it internally within our business, it's the idea of almost mentorship at end of career. It allows a retiring uh, employee to, to mentor their replacement, transfer the knowledge, transfer a degree of comfort with the role, and, and do that with as much um, time as possible. Organizations were really happy when they're able to instill these types of programs within their business, but again, there has to be trust between the employee and the employer that, that there's a degree of respect given um, and, and uh, open communication. So we, we, we talk about you know, challenging you on, you know, again, do you have mentorship programs to connect retiring employees with new hires or, or, or replacements within the business? You know, what do those programs look like? You know, how are they executed? How well are they accepted? Are they trusted within, within the employee base? What can be done to create a, a better culture about accepting retiring staff and how do we em embrace that group and help them transition out of the organization effectively, but also with enough lead time. When talking about retirement as a whole, again, in terms of or not even just retirement, but ultimately retainment, uh, respondents gave a variety of different programs that worked. Uh, one of the most commonly mentioned were some form of incentive program. This is not about um, uh, you know, uh, incentive necessarily for retainment, although we did hear every so often about some type of bonus for, for, for time, with, in time served with the company and stuff like that. But it had more to do with the fact that the talent these days, in particular younger talent, wants recognition. So this, re you know, this ultimately meant um, smaller or moderate sized uh, incentives that were sort of executed on a, a quarterly basis. You've got performance in, uh, programs or pro performance incentives. Um, sometimes those, those the recognition didn't involve some type of monetary incentive, but, but merely recognition, some type of award. Uh, again, the younger workforce these days uh, has a tendency to, to it resonates well with them, and ultimately organizations that have some type of uh, frequent recognition program uh, found that, that retainment was an easier goal to hit. Um, again, flexible work schedules. Um, again, high-touch communication was another area that was mentioned. The, the, the high-touch communication was, was an interesting one, and I think one that organizations struggle with, but it's an important change to their, their business and, frankly, their culture. The communication is more about opening up a path that employees can engage leadership directly and just overall seeing leadership engage staff more directly. Again, for a younger workforce, for, for younger individuals, this is important. There's a belief that, that leadership having direct lines of communication with their employees or with them is an important bond that's developed and it's a feeling of openness that, that's created. This is not something that many organizations uh, initially have as part of their culture. It's not the way that many organizations and just leadership was designed. There's, there's a lot of steps in between executive leadership and, and uh, the entry-level employee. But the goal is that with some of these programs is to, to bridge those gaps and ultimately have leadership directly engage even the, the newest employees as early and as frequent as possible, um, just showing a degree of personality and care and interest. And that's one of the key elements. Um, there's also, um, when talking with respondents about what doesn't work well, um, points programs are mentioned, um, merit programs are mentioned most frequently as being you know, unused, basically points programs are referred to crediting certain types of, of points for employees to, to, to get access to certain benefits or meet, meet certain types of goals. A point program was mentioned as, as not having the type of pull that, that respondents thought worked well or there'd be unused points at the end which largely employees felt were ineffective. Um, two other areas that were mentioned uh, which took us a little bit by surprise were this notion of you know, company picnics and tuition reimbursement, the last one being, frankly, the most surprising. 
not too many respondents brought up company picnics, but it was interesting to engage on it. And it, ultimately, a company picnic was raised by some respondents about retention, the idea of creating this feeling of family and culture that ultimately when building, building a culture is important, but the use of traditional picnics did not seem to really have an impact on retention at all. In some instances and with some respondents, and these are relatively senior respondents, they found that, that picnics ended up being in some cases a burden. And ultimately it didn't engage uh, employees, again, on, typically on their time off. There was one instance that, that a respondent spoke about how they had a, a company picnic and no one showed up you know, which is a, a real blow to the, the culture of a business, but also indicative of the disconnect between leadership and what employees are looking for out of, out of their organization. Um, again, more frequent and higher, it's it really a replacement, not even a replacement of, of picnics, but it's really the idea that more frequent events or higher frequency in communication from leadership that engages staff is likely to have a higher impact on retention. On the topic of tuition reimbursement, it's, the, um, it's not the fact that it doesn't have a value. It's the fact that, that companies that, um, that have these types of programs, uh, all they ended up doing is outlasting or lasting the, the uh, employee requirements or the employment requirements that, are, that typically exist. Or tuition programs typically require years of service. And that moment that that contract came due and that, that the time was fulfilled, candidates left or employees left. So essentially, the employees executed programs that retained an employee for another two years or three years for, for that contract to, to, to execute, and then they were gone. Um, it didn't really help retention at all. Again, we think there's value to tuition programs, but um, again, there has to be some other mechanism that's designed to keep uh, employees, that, that, that tuition reimbursement programs don't necessarily create a, a, a connection in their own right. There has to be other engagement that happens uh, in some of the other topics we talked about, whether it's incentives or communication or, or um, again, flexible schedules of some kind for, for employees that can, uh, or, or positions that allow it. And summarizing, um, we wanted to give a, a summary here and sort of conclusion in terms of the you know, top learnings. Um, first, it, it starts with building awareness, removing stig the stigma associated with manufacturing today, changing the image, making it look as high-tech as it actually is, and, and getting uh, um, uh, potential candidate streams to understand that as young as possible. That, that migrates and changes to apprenticeships and working with education centers to essentially siphon off high talent and getting them engaged with the business as early as possible and frankly, ideally, earning money. To, to, to the high school uh, uh, students and, and early college, uh, those types of programs can produce uh, tremendous results. Uh, once you have that type of recruiting talent, talent and then getting into a more educated space, it moves to more formalized internships and, and, and uh, recruitment programs that are designed to give both education and real world, real world experience at the right time. Um, leveraging communication and developing incentive programs that, words, that, that reward strong performance and outcomes, um, ultimately produce great results and longer retainment. Uh, improving communication and engaging from leadership down uh, to all levels of the organization are viewed as important changes in culture and behavior to ultimately feel employees more connected with the business. Um, and then ultimately creating a culture that embraces retirement and ultimately develops awareness of retirement well ahead of the retirement event uh, provides strong success. And then to help retain that talent, uh, the retiring talent, again, work for, work for, workplace flexibility with employees will help uh, keep talent there longer and essentially adapting programs that help uh, employees exit with grace and, and, and a longer period of time will produce a stronger degree of success. Um, that largely concludes what we wanted to cover with you today. Uh, on the following slide here is just a brief uh, summary of the demographics that we spoke to for this engagement. Uh, the key here is that we essentially researched organizations that had 250 employees or less. Um, most of the organizations we spoke to were medium in size and then a handful were small. 
and most of where we spent our, our time was on equipment manufacturers, uh, pharmaceutical companies, food companies, and material suppliers, all really around uh, packaging, machinery, and, process, and food processing, and then a handful that were outside but still related in the manufacturing space. We uh, thank you for your time.